My name is Scott Knudsen. I'm with Signature Home Inspection. Um, we're located in Santa Ana, California. We cover pretty much most of the southern part of California, uh, North San Diego County, uh, parts of Riverside and Santa Bernardino, uh, parts of LA, uh, but we cover all of Orange County. So um, if you need any type of inspections like a home inspection, commercial inspection, sewer inspection, pool and spa, uh, mold testing. Uh, we can do radon inspections, which uh, there's very few in our area that can do those, uh, as well as um, uh, methamphetamine testing. So if there's ever a house that has a mess. So we can do all kinds of different testing and inspections. Um, I'm going to give you our contact information at the end of the class um, where you can reach us out if you have any questions um, and give you our uh, information where if you need to order inspection, you can do that online as well. So a uh, little bit about, about myself. I've been doing inspections, uh, I believe it's 20 years in um, May. And um, in that time frame, I would say 10 of those years I've spent here in Orange County. Uh, I started the business in another state and then we relocated here um, about 10 years ago. So uh, I've got a whole uh, wealth of knowledge from different areas. And um, uh, also we have a, a really good website that has a lot of information as well. So. Uh, you can always direct your clients to that if they have uh, questions on uh, preferred contractors and so forth. So, all right. So today's class is new homes, a closer look, um, valuable information for the real estate agent. Some of this stuff uh, may be um, something that you're already familiar with. Uh, some of it might be new. Uh, at some point, I'm going to have to update this presentation uh, because um, I've done this was done a few years ago, and uh, we're already seeing new stuff that's uh, 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 just it's just wasn't out when this was presentation was built that I just need to update this with. So um, we do also have other classes that we teach um, at different associations around uh, Orange County and LA. Um, I would say uh, our most popular classes are uh, strictly, you know, regarding mold inspections. We have a popular one about mold inspections, and then we also have two home inspection classes. So if you ever see those pop up, uh, those are some of our more expensive, or not more expensive, but more um, attended uh, classes that we have. So, all right, so let's get started. Um, so we're going to go over uh, a couple of different parts here. So on the outline, part one, uh, what's new in homes? We're going to go over an overview of some of the newer components found in new homes today. Uh, we're going to go in part two, we're going to go over typical problem areas that we typically see on new homes. Uh, the common problem areas with new homes are different from those found in resale homes. And then what are the common problems in the new homes that we uh, tend to see? So, and then part three, we're going to kind of go over uh, the difference in the, ins the inspection of new homes versus uh, older homes. Um, so we get that question a lot. Uh, from people saying, hey, I'm building a new home or I'm having a new home built. Do I need a home inspection on it? Uh, I would always say yes, because we find stuff on new home inspections or new new construction uh, versus uh, older homes. So uh, they might not be the same, but we still see issues that are typical of uh, new home construction. So uh, for example, I've done new home construction where uh, everything looked good. And then I got up in the attic and they had not blown the insulation. Um, that might not have been found until, uh, you know, three or four months later, where after the summer, they're like, man, my AC is not working. I can't figure out why the house isn't cooling down. And then come to find out that uh, they just wasted all that power and uh, money that it cost to, uh, you know, cool the house down. Um, and uh, that could have been resolved if they would have found out that there was no insulation in the attic. So. Let's see, part one, what's new in home? So with people around you, and again, this class is meant to be in person. Uh, we're not back to that yet, uh, but it sounds like we are gonna be back to that next year. So uh, with people around you, discuss the following. Issues that you're, you've come across when listing a new home. Uh, issues with clients when considering a new home. Uh, were any of these deal breakers? So kind of consider that. If you've ever dealt with a new home uh, purchase uh, and you've been the real estate agent on that, what are some of the issues? I can think of one off the top of my head is that we were doing a new home construction uh, inspection. And uh, for whatever reason, the AC unit was placed right outside the window that uh, joined the dining room and the living room. So every time that thing was on, it was just loud and uh, it wasn't the best placement uh, for the home. And so um, that, you know, it's not something that we as home inspectors would typically say, you know, there's not a there's not a requirement that it has to be somewhere 
but it was enough to where the buyer had requested that it be moved and, um, you know, to the back of the home to where it wasn't uh, interfering with, you know, them trying to enjoy dinner at the dining table. So, um, but that's just something that comes off the top of my head. Uh, what's new in homes? So trust choice will replace the solid wood choice. So we're, we're already seeing that and most of the construction that we're seeing. Uh, plastic water supply piping becoming more common. Uh, we're typically seeing PEX versus copper. Copper's gotten really expensive, and so we're seeing more PEX piping. Uh, art fault circuit interrupters and expanded use of GFCIs. We've seen that over the years where pretty much everything that's near water now, uh, on as far as GFCIs go, even laundry now, uh, new home construction are going to require a GFCI. Uh, alt fault, art, art fault circuit interrupters, to say that really quick, um, you, a lot of times uh, those are the out the um, the outlets that have the blue uh, breakers on. They're like a little button on them inside the panel. Um, they're becoming more and more common to where pretty soon I wouldn't doubt that there wouldn't be uh, every breaker in the panel will have those. Uh, the reason why it's not right now is just because they're expensive breakers. They're not they're not cheap. They're about fifty to sixty bucks a piece. So that's why we don't see them. Um, but they're getting that way. Uh, and then more efficient HVAC units. Uh, we're starting to see more and more efficient HVAC units um, that um, are more reasonably priced than what they used to be. Uh, number one, Trust Choice replaced solid wood. So uh, Trust Choice have been around for a long time. They will become more common as standard dimensional lumber gets harder to find, more expensive to process and transport. Uh, that's something that's been happening since the pandemic started, where lumber prices were just outrageous because uh, it was just very difficult to get uh, most of the wood that we're seeing is coming from Canada, and it was just difficult to get over the border, and prices went up because uh, labor went up. Um, you know, basic supply and demand. Uh, there was more uh, uh, demand than there was supply, thus prices went way up. Uh, dimensional lumber, uh, you have uh, dimensional lumber are wood members cut from trees, uh, floor joists need large trees, two by tens, for example. So if you've got a two by 10, that's uh, two feet by 10. So you would need a tree uh, that's at least 10 feet uh, to be able to make one of those. So um, with the truss joist, that maximizes the use of wood, wood fibers placed only where needed. So you can see here the eye shape uh, profile. Uh, uses small, fast growth trees, uh, uses less wood fiber, 50% less sometimes, and it's more environmentally friendly. Um, so, and you can have it as long as you want. So you can, you know, you can see how long these are. These are, these are uh, longer than uh, two by tens, for, for example. Uh, here's some examples of some of the uh, uh, joists that we we're talking about. Um, and you can see that the, um, you know, different use of the wood fiber. Uh, some of these are beams, some of these are posts, uh, but you get the idea of uh, how they're basically just compressed wood. Uh, longer clear spans. So custom homes with an open concept uh, that have, um, you know, that they want these long spans. And trust joists can clear span long distances. So it's possible to eliminate the need, uh, need for a main beam at mid span. Um, so a lot of the custom homes uh, are using this longer clear spans. A lot of the construction today is using this type uh, of uh, trust joints. Joist. Uh, trust joists and growing pain. So some of the issues that, were, that they were having was that the floor seemed bouncy to some. Uh, why was that? So some uh, long clear spans uh, the vibration transfer wasn't adequate. Uh, you have different balance and vibration characteristics compared to dimensional lumber. Uh, and then floors evaluated with no furniture load. Um, so, um, for example, if you get into a house that is vacant, doesn't have any furniture in it, um, back then, uh, sometimes you would feel a little bit of vibration as you're walking through because there was nothing that was offsetting it. So, uh, versus say you went into a house that had furniture, um, a grand piano and so forth, you wouldn't feel that bounciness as much as you would. Uh, long clear span. So some of this, you won't need to have to exactly know all this, but I uh, just wanted to give you some uh, talking points, um, kind of give you an overview. Uh, so if you hear this L360, L480, you'll kind of know what they're talking about. So uh, allowable uh, deflection is a percentage of span. So the longer the spans means the greater deflection. Uh, span meaning their deflection, meaning you know, how much vibration is in it. 
So uh, the L360 versus the L480, example, span is 15 feet. Uh, and L360 gives a deflection of a half of an inch. L480 gives a deflection of three eighths of an inch. Um, so now stiffer. So older truss joist installations were bouncy. So uh, if you had um, the original truss joist that they were building uh, back in the day, uh, you'd feel a little bit more of a bounce. And I don't know. I mean, you could probably still see it today in some of these houses. I would say probably in the 80s, 90s when they started using this. Uh, sometimes you'll feel that bounce when you're walking around. It has nothing to do with the structural integrity. It's just the uh, uh, the joist, uh, uh, the, the deflection um, wasn't high enough. So, uh, for example, match deflection and strength of dimensional lumber was an L360, left a perception of a bouncy floor. Many builders now use a much higher level for stiffness and L480 or greater, so it feels less bouncy. So if you're dealing with a, uh, a new construction builder, um, this is something that you might want to look into uh, when they're building a home. You know, what are they using? Are they using an L480? Uh, are they, you know, are, are they doing the minimum? That would be the minimum today would be the L480. If, say, for example, it's an L580, for example, then they're using a, a higher level of trust. Uh, for more stiffness. Uh, buyer tip, ask builder for details on the floor design. Builder can cut costs by using a less stiff floor structure still within building code. Stiffer floor costs more, but feels better. What's the deflection design criteria used for the floor design? So you could ask that question. What's the deflection? If they, you know, such as an L360 or 480. So usually the higher the number, the better. Um, I've got a friend that just bought a new construction uh, last year. I think his one-year warranty is coming up. And uh, I was in the home and it's just crazy how they're just doing the bare minimum. A lot of these uh, contractor or construction companies are. Uh, I think he said his list for his 11-month uh, warranty, um, you know, 12-month warranty, but we call it 11-month because you want to get it done before. So they have time to repair it. Uh, I think he had 16 items that he wanted them to come out and fix. And uh, I told him, uh, I actually stayed with him over the weekend. And I said, uh, you know, add uh, uh, locks on bedroom doors. They had the bedroom doors didn't even have locks on. Um, and I don't know if that's a requirement, but you know, that is something that should be standard, you know, um, but they're just, you know, they're, I don't know if the cost is that big of a difference. You know, maybe it's a couple of dollars. Um, but um, I guess apparently it adds up because uh, how I can go into a house and I can tell if it's a low uh, quality build and they're skimping on stuff is uh, based off of the toilet. If it's the elongated bowl versus the not elongated bowl, if they're using the nominally long, not the short bowl, uh, they're trying to save money. Uh, they're being cheap. Uh, it's not that much more expensive to have the elongated bowl, uh, but builders will do that. So, um, you know, it is what it is. Apparently, some of the builders now uh, aren't even doing upgrades. There are, you know, I don't know, maybe now they are, but back when the market was hot, uh, they were just basically saying, this is what you're getting. So, um, you know, because they could charge for that. So, um, number two, plastic water supply pipe. Uh, we're talking about the interior water supply. So, copper has been the standard quality for many years. Uh, early plastic pipe was a problem, so this is polybutylene. Uh, that is the typically the gray piping, and I've got a picture after this uh, slide of what that type typically looks like. I haven't seen too much of that piping. Um, I did, I have seen a little bit in San, North San Diego County, uh, but uh, that type of piping, if we see polybutylene piping, we will recommend that it be further evaluated by a plumber because they have had so many problems with it that uh, we don't want to put you in jeopardy. We don't want to put us in jeopardy of having any issues with that because uh, if it doesn't have issues now, it will in the future. It's kind of like some of these uh, you know, the problems that we've had with slab leaks, uh, where they, uh, you know, embedded all the piping on the concrete. Uh, I remember when they were doing that in the 90s, I'm like, this does not make sense. Because I, because at the time I worked for a contractor and uh, was building houses with them, and they're burying these pipes in the concrete. I'm like, what happens if there's ever a leak? What, they, what happens? And uh, it just didn't make sense. And so that now we have all these slab leaks because of it. So same with the polybutylene piping. Uh, if there's not any issues, uh, you will have issues at some point. Uh, plast, current plastic pipe does not have the problems of poly B. So that's where I'm typically talking about PEX. So I'll show you a picture of that here shortly. Uh, why plastic pipe? Uh, it's quick to install. There's fewer joints, uh, long rolls of pipe. 
Uh, the pipe can be pulled throughout the house. Uh, you can have multiple parallel runs rather than series of tree uh, type structure. And uh, better water flow characteristics and less pressure drop with multiple uh, fixture operations. So, um, you know, the, what I like about this type of piping is I don't see it too much in California, but in other areas, you can have like these manifolds. They're like a plumbing manifold. And it's kind of like a junction box for electrical. And you can actually open up the box and you can actually turn off the water in a certain area where you want it to turn off. Um, you know, if you're going to be working in a certain area. So that's kind of neat how they have that. And I think I might have a picture of that. Oh, just a picture of uh, the old piper, a uh, copper pipe. I mean, they, they still use it today, but it's more expensive uh, to uh, pipe a house with copper. Uh, here's some pictures. So the, the red and the blue uh, are, are, are pecs. Uh, you've got the copper here uh, at the bottom here to the left. Uh, that's what polybutylene typically looked like. And then some of this other piping would be piping for uh, plumbing fixtures. Um, but, uh, you know, blue, um, it doesn't, they don't think they do the blue or red anymore. They typically will have just a, um, just a white pipe and then you'll have like a blue line on it and then a, a red line and that will tell you whether it's hot or cold. So this one would be the hot and this would be the uh, cold. Uh, quality plastic used today is PEX. Uh, it's cross-link polyethylene. Uh, it's not a new system. It's been in use for many years in Europe for uh, supply plumbing and radiant heat applications. It's a high quality system and it has a long lifespan. Um, you know, when they say it's not a new system, for example, tankless water heaters. Tankless water heaters are relatively um, becoming more, I mean, they're, they're relatively newer in the US. Uh, but they've been used for years overseas. Uh, and the main reason why is because, you know, not, you know, if you've ever been to Europe and you've been in a small apartment, there's really no place for a big water tank. Uh, and so they've been using, uh, you know, the tankless water heater systems for a while. Now. So uh, same with this PEX. Uh, it was just easier to pipe, you know, some of those older, uh, you know, buildings that were built, you know, 1700s, 1600s, uh, very difficult to go in and replace all the piping, you know, uh, it's just a lot easier to pull that plastic piping through. So number three, we're going over to electrical. So AFCI uh, and GFCI. So uh, GFCI stands for ground fault circuit interrupter, uh, helps to prevent serious electrocution, uh, not new, but newly expanded use. I had a, um, a Zoom call before this, so... Um, Bear with me on my voice. Um, so, and then the AFCI. So AFCI stands for all arc fault circuit interrupter, protects the house from possible fire from arcing in the electrical system. Uh, it's been used in new homes only since uh, 2006. So uh, GFCIs uh, today on houses uh, would be typically rule of thumb is within six feet of water. So we typically will see that in a kitchen, bathrooms, garages, uh, exterior, uh, now in the laundry rooms, uh, and then um, anywhere outside. So if you've got uh, outlets out by the pool, uh, even if it's underneath uh, like a, um, like a, oh, what do they call it, a gazebo, uh, they would still need to be GFCI protected because it's outside. Um, this is just an image of that uh, AFCI. Uh, this is kind of what it does. So you have this little blue button. This I got to get a better picture of it. Uh, but for example, if somebody was to hang a picture and they hit into the electrical wire, it'll flip that breaker off. Uh, EFC, AFCIs are currently used only for bedroom circuits in new homes. Uh, that's been expanded since this um, um, presentation was created, um, but not by much. So not required in all areas of the home because of the high cost of the, these breakers. Uh, over time, more areas of the home will require AFCI protection uh, due to uh, electrical codes. So, uh, next one: efficient air conditioning. So, uh, how you uh, you know if you've ever heard the word SEER, SEER stands for Seasonal Energy Efficiency Ratio. As of 2006, there are new minimum efficiency requirements, um, and since 2006, they've probably updated that since. But I'm going to go through some of these for you. Uh, new systems are at least 30% more efficient than systems uh, from a few years ago. Uh, minimum SEER since 2006 was a SEER of 13. Uh, Energy Star rating is a minimum of SEER of 14. 
Prior to 87, typical was 78. Uh, from 87 to 2006, minimum was 10. Uh, some today are well over SEER 17 and up to 21. So they've probably even gone up higher since then. So uh, if you are ever uh, hear that word SEER, that's what they're talking about. Uh, high efficiency furnaces. Again, they're not new, but costs have come down and reliability has gone up. So we're starting to see more of these. In the past, uh, benefit marginal. Um, so they just, you know, for the cost, it wasn't that much of benefit for it. So that's kind of, you know, it's becoming, uh, the costs have come way down, reliability has gone up. High efficiency furnace, only 12 to 15% more efficient than mids, but cost 40% more to purchase, more repairs and shorter life cycles. So um, uh, a good way to determine if a unit is high efficiency, a lot of times is, is that if you look at the flu and it's a plastic, um, where it's pulling in, um, you know, the plastic uh, fluid versus the metal, that's a good indicator that it might be a high efficiency furnace. Part two, common problem areas in new homes. Um, so keep in mind that uh, no perfect homes, uh, even new, exist. We always find stuff on most homes. I think there's only been one home in 20 years that I've seen that uh, there was only one issue. Uh, I've never seen a house that didn't have something that we didn't find. Maybe it wasn't such a big deal, but it was something that would be a maintenance item or an FYI. Uh, but we generally see something that either needs to be corrected or monitored. So uh, it should be no surprise to this group that there is no such thing as a perfect home. Uh, new homes are the same. It's just that the problems are different. Uh, problem areas that we typically see on a new construction. Uh, one, uh, first one is the most common, uh, incomplete work. Uh, like I was saying earlier about uh, uh, the attic. Uh, you go up in the attic, uh, usually that's the last area that a home inspector will go into, uh, either that or a crawl space. And uh, that's usually where we see a lot of the uh, incomplete work uh, is up in the attic because you know they either forget about it or they, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. So. Um, that's usually the most common uh, was incomplete work, uh, stuff that was damaged, um, that, uh, you know, either a tile was damaged and they didn't see it or they've got a window frame that's broke. Um, we see stuff like that all the time. Uh, stuff that's missing. Uh, a lot of times we get, once we inspect the roof, uh, there will be tiles that will be missing. There will be flashing that's missing that you can't see. And then the other is imperfect workmanship. Uh, when houses are selling, uh, flying off the shelf like they have been the last few years, uh, builders are basically hiring whoever they can get. And sometimes that means uh, sub uh, quality contractors. And so they get imperfect workmanship. Uh, and when they're going fast, uh, they make errors, they make mistakes. Uh, and so that's something to where uh, a lot of times people, when they're doing a, a new build, they will hire what's called a phase inspection and they can actually uh, do inspections in phases. So they make sure that it's done correctly as they're building the house. Uh, let's look at some examples of common issues with new homes, including interior and exterior finish issues, grading issues, roofing issues, insulation and ducting issues, and last but not least, structural issues. So interior and exterior. Uh, sometimes a lot of the most common that we see is tile and floor damage. Uh, that's a common defect, uh, maybe minor repair or major issue, uh, maybe caused by uh, floor framing issues, subfloor issues, inadequate mortar thickness for tile type. Uh, a lot of times when you, depending on the type of tile that they're using, uh, if they don't use uh, the, the correct thickness for the mortar, um, the tile will just start to loosen up and it'll start to crack. Uh, inadequate floor stiffness for the tile type, uh, and then sloppy tile or grout work. We see that a lot. Uh, and here is the tile grout damage, very common. This does not mean that this is a big defect, but it shouldn't happen this fast. Uh, so what happens is when you're doing the corners of a shower, for example, uh, and they lay this grout in here, uh, there's, you know, if they don't do it correctly, it'll shrink. And then when it shrinks, it starts to crack. Um, some of them will have a type of grout that can actually, it's kind of a more of a rubberized grout to where it will, um, you know, adjust for the shrinkage. But on this one here, you would have to regrout this or seal it. Uh, Subquality workmanship, broken tile, um, you know, it's not even, it's not even lined up correctly. So you can see here how this is like a door frame uh, where the wood floor meets the tile. Um, just, they just missed it. So. 
Water, leaks are common issues in new homes and proper caulking or grout, missing or sloppy flashing, foundation shrinkage cracks. Uh, this is down in a basement uh, where there was water that was coming up from the floor. Siding, poor siding insulation is a common new home defect, buckling and bowing of siding material, uh, improper um, attachment, uh, wood siding too close to the roof, poor flashing, we see that quite a bit. Uh, here's some siding. Uh, this is composite siding, uh, not the highest quality. We, we do see it around, around quite a bit. Problem with this type of siding is that if it gets wet, uh, it just, be, it just comes, becomes really brittle. Uh, the positive thing is that it's relatively inexpensive to replace. So, uh, But these are you know pop nail heads. Grading issues where they don't backflow properly. Uh, here is on a house that has a basement that... Um, um, a couple issues here. Uh, if you've ever seen an inspector uh, make a note of downspout extensions, this is a perfect example why. So you might think that it's a minor issue, but if I see a downspout extension that turns right next to the house, uh, and, you know, they've got a splash block here, but it's really not doing anything. That splash block should be turned this way and pulling that water away. But since it's not, it's really not doing anything. That water is basically pooling around this area and it's settling the soil. And what happens over time is, is that, you know, anytime you have a heavy rainstorm, that water is just going to pool right here. It's going to go right into the basement. So ideally, downspout extensions should turn uh, three to six feet away from the house. Uh, that's what we like to see, ideally. Um, you know, in California, we don't get a lot of rain, um, but it uh, still doesn't matter. We still recommend three to six feet. Uh, here's some uh, grading issues to where you probably see that we see this quite a bit, where the grading is right up against the seal plate. So underneath this wall, you have what's called a seal plate, and it's made out of redwood. And that redwood's there for a reason, because they don't want that uh, seal plate to rot out. And so redwood's, a, you know, it's a, uh, it's a higher quality uh, wood, and it doesn't rot like normal wood would. It will over time, but uh, when you have, oops, when you have uh, moisture that gets in there uh, and over time it'll just start to seep in there and sometimes it can rot out your wall from the outside so ideally we like to see again three to six inches of uh, you know minimum of three inches where you can see the actual foundation wall uh, other things with this issue is that subterranean termites in our area love to go in from the ground up uh, we have typically two types of we have the swarmers that fly and then the ones that come up from the ground uh, the ones that come up from the ground, they're a soft bodied uh, insect, and so they don't like to be exposed to the elements. And so this is a perfect area for them to come up and through here. So if I see this on an inspection, I'm going to make a note of it. Um, roofing, you know, uh, poor installation on shingles. Um, these needed uh, three nails. They've only got two. Uh, improper flashing, not uh, finished. See here, you can you know you can get rodents in here. You can get birds. You can get white moisture. Um, this is sometimes uh, areas that you can't see from the ground uh, unless you have an inspection. Uh, again, missing shingle and flashing at the gable. Uh, here's a tile roof where you can see the mortar is already breaking up, pulling out of here. So that would need to be replaced. You can see how it's slipping out. Uh, insulation and ducting. Uh, this is an attic, missing insulation in the attic. Um, what happens is that if you're trying to heat your house or cool your house during the summer or heat it during the wintertime, that heat will just go right up out of this area. So um, you'd want to uh, make sure that you fill this back in with insulation. So um, they might have done a repair or might have put in. What happens a lot of times is if somebody comes in and puts in uh, recessed lights, they will move that away so they can put the lights in, but they don't put it back, which is just drives me crazy. So, uh, or they did some kind of roof repair and then they didn't put the insulation back. Uh, six inch, uh, six inches of insulation is supposed to be 10.75 on the data uh, data plate. So uh, you should have uh, another uh, almost uh, six inches more or five inches more. Uh, this is the duct work uh, where it connects into uh, the return. Uh, you can see here how it wasn't sealed properly. Uh, you're going to lose your heating and cooling efficiency uh, if it's not done properly. Uh, disconnected ducting. Uh, ducting. You can see here how it's dropped out. Uh, you don't want to be heating an unfinished space or cooling an unfinished space. Not very efficient. Um, 
here is um, uh, airflow from that one. So that one there, uh, basically, you know, when we're checking uh, to make sure that there's proper airflow coming out of each uh, ductwork or vents, um, we're checking that. Structure, here's some uh, shrinkage cracks. Uh, again, some shrinkage cracks here. Uh, settlement cracks, uh, foundation cracks. You know, typically we see this type of stuff. It could be something that's minor, uh, but when we see cracks that are over a certain size, we're going to recommend that it be uh, you know checked out. Don't want to mess around with uh, structural is issues. So you know, if you suspect that there might be a structural problem, uh, don't mess around with it. You don't want to be sued later on. Um, if you suspect that there's a structural or if your client says anything, you know, this is this is my recommendation. If your client says something like, hey, my family's got asthma, I would really like to have the house tested for air quality, for mold specifically, don't say, no, you don't need it. It's not that worry. You know, if they bring it up, rec you know, recommend the testing. If they are worried about a structural uh, problem, you know, if they think that there's a structural problem, get a structural engineer out there or get a contractor that's familiar with that. Don't, you know, you just don't, you want to avoid the lawsuits. Uh, if they're buying a house that's up on the hill and they're concerned about the soil, uh, you should have somebody that's on, you know, that you know that you can call right away, a soil engineer that can come out and put their mind at ease. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to say, oh, you don't need that. If they're bringing it up, they have a concern about it. And you should make sure that, you know, you, you know, make sure that everything's covered. So you're covering, uh, you know, your butt uh, later on. Uh, excessive brick overhang. Uh, here is where plumbers, plumbers should never have access to a saw. Uh, they basically will come in here and this is just the way that the architect drew it up. Not really the plumber's fault, but they should probably go to the contractor first and say, hey, uh, you know, this, this framing or this choice is right where my pipe needs to be. So right now, this, they, they've just structurally altered this and this is a weakness in the structure because they cut that. Uh, doesn't mean it can't be fixed, but it needs to be fixed. So here again, they cut this uh, floor joist. When they cut it like that, that just basically ruined that whole floor joist. There's no way to repair this. So they would have to fix that. It'd probably be a pretty expensive fix. Uh, damaged floor joist, um, again, weakened. Uh, here, there's no truss hangers installed. There should be a metal bracket truss hanger. Uh, here's one that's uh, not properly installed and it's not big enough. It's not long enough. So uh, this constructor, this construction company just basically was using whatever they had. They were just grabbing, uh, you know, oh, you know, here's some missing ones. Uh, you know, it's not in the right bracket. Cross bracing not properly installed. You can see here how it's popped out. It's not, not you know, and what that does is that keeps those um, uh, the floor joists uh, from separating or going wider or, or too narrow. So uh, this is kind of a picture I pulled off the internet. Uh, look at that driveway. Who in their right mind would think that that was okay? Um, here's some pictures again. Uh, that's an SUV, that's a Suburban or a Yukon. Uh, a Tesla is not gonna make it up that hill and not make it over that clearance. That car, that truck just barely did. So uh, inspection of new homes, uh, phased inspection. I talked about that earlier. Inspection during construction at various phases after the foundation pour, before backfilling, et cetera. Uh, this is the best way to uncover construction defects. Um, if you're building a custom home, um, a lot of times banks will not, you know, and, and you're actually building it yourself. A lot of times the banks won't release the money unless there's somebody that's doing these phase inspections to let them know, okay, uh, they put up the drywall, we're ready for the next uh, allotment of money. So they don't just say, here's a half a million dollars to build a house. They release that money at different times. Um, so if you're building a home, uh, you could request that you have an inspector do a phase inspection. It's not so common in Southern California, uh, but in other areas of the country, it's very common. So uh, that's something that if your buyer is really, you know, worried about the uh, quality of construction, they could have what's called a phase inspection. Uh, and, and we would, you know, home inspectors will come out during different phases of the build. Uh, cold shoulder. Inspectors are not always welcome on the building site. We get that quite a bit. So much so that some construction companies are requiring 
ridiculous amounts of uh, insurance. Uh, we cover, um, we, our insurance policy is a $2 million policy, which is pretty high. Um, but sometimes they will say, okay, we want a $4 million policy, which is, I've never even heard of a $4 million policy. And they do that because they don't want uh, home buyers to bring third party inspectors because uh, it makes their job a lot harder. Uh, I've, uh, there's been some contractor or construction companies that will require that we cover our uh, cars with a million dollar policy. Uh, if I ever get a request from that, I don't, I just, I don't even want to deal with it. I, I you know, I, I'm not going to put a million dollar policy on my car just to go inspect uh, a new, new, you know, just, just to meet their requirement. I mean, they're just making us jump through hoops. So uh, keep that in mind. You know, you will see that you will, you will come across that where they're just uh, requiring a ridiculous amount of insurance coverage just to have somebody come out. Um, uh, it may be in the contract that you're not allowed on site. Uh, for example, you're not allowed to have a third party inspection. Uh, this has been set up and cleared at contract stage. Uh, your inspector will be visiting the site at various stages specified in the contract. Uh, let's see, a viable option uh, to doing a PDI inspection is a 30 day inspection. The inspector and clients do a walkthrough inspection 30 days after they have taken position to document defects to forward to the builder. This is followed up by 11 month inspection to document all outstanding defects before the 12 month warranty. So if you ever get uh, a contractor or a builder that's being very difficult about having a third party inspection, have us come in after the inspection. After everybody's moved in, you can, because you still have that warranty period to where you can have them fix stuff. So if they are making it difficult to do an inspection before you close on the property, uh, they still have to, uh, you know, make any type of repair. So you can have, you can hire an inspector to come out after they close. So we, we've, you know, sometimes I've just told people and said, listen, this builder is making it very difficult. They're requiring a ridiculous amount of insurance, blah, blah, blah. They're trying to get you from doing a third party inspection. Have us come in after you've moved in, then we can do the same type of inspection. Uh, warranty inspection, these are not as effective as phase inspections, but it's worthwhile and necessary to fulfill warranty claims within the allowable uh, reporting period. So uh, if your client is buying a, uh, a new home, uh, typically they will have a one year, the builder will have a one year warranty on it. Um, and um, you can have an inspector come in and do an inspection and write up a report that you can give to the builder and say, hey, uh, we need this stuff fixed before the end of our warranty. So that's why we call them 11 month, because you typically will order the inspection during the 11th month before the 12 month expires. Uh, inspector will get to areas you may not be able to see. Uh, we can create a punch list of things for the builder to fix. No issues with site access as you have already taken possession. Real estate agent, what information did you learn that you will allow you to better assist your clients? Uh, hopefully you learned some new strategies you use as a result of this course. And what recommendations will you make to clients considering purchasing a new home? So that's the end of the class. Uh, this one, like I said, doesn't go as long as an hour. Um, I'm going to get to your questions here in the chat and the questions. Uh, before I do that, I wanted to give you my information. So uh, our contact information is below here. So 888-860-2688. Uh, my email, if you have any questions, uh, you can send me an email at scott at signaturemore.com. Uh, and our website, again, signaturemore.com. Uh, you can actually place an order uh, for an inspection online 24-7. And you can actually pick the dates and times and the inspector that you want. And uh, once you hit submit, you've scheduled your inspection. So I think that's the easiest way versus calling back and forth because sometimes people will call and say, what do you have open on these days? Uh, and I'll give them the times and dates. And then they call back six hours later and expect that that time to be open and it's not. So I usually say, hey, find out when you when you can do the inspection and then check our schedule online. You can schedule that way. So let me get to your questions here before we get off. Uh, let's see, you mentioned that you would not do an inspection if a builder was unreasonable with insurance requirements. If a builder asks for unreasonable insurance requirements for an inspection, what do you suggest to the client? So that would be, I would do that after the inspection. So again, I'm not going to go and uh, purchase a $1 million insurance policy just for my vehicle that I'm going to drive. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's unreasonable. The, the vehicle that I'm driving in the inspection has nothing to do with the inspection. They're just, they're just being, making it difficult. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is MIDS? I'm not sure your question on that. So if you can clarify that, that'd be great. 
Um, but yeah, so if there's a builder that's being unreasonable um, um, and they are just heart set on using that builder, then I would just recommend that you do the inspection after they close. Because they're still you'd still be able to get the stuff um, um, you know, requested during that that one year warranty. Um, yeah, so if, if you ask if you ask the question what is uh, mids, uh, I'm not I'm not clear on what you're asking there. Let's see here. All right, I think that's it. So if you guys have any other questions, uh, like I said, feel free to email me, scott at signaturemore.com. But that's it for today. Thanks, everybody.